So the title of my piece is called An Inconvenient Booth. And we start out in 1967 when the world flocked to Montreal, Canada for Expo 67, a celebration that had more than two and a half times the population of Canada at that time attend. One of the important innovations from Expo 67 <laughs> is the well-known IMAX technology. But one of the other important innovations from that time was of a humbler sort, and that is the public conveniences marked out in a graphical, non-lingual symbol, a symbol devised by Toronto designer Paul Arthur. Arthur's designs was part of a series of 24 pictograms. They were part of a comprehensive sign manual for use in Expo 67. They were an outline of a humanoid figure with a floating head that would remain recognizable today as symbol to indicate a men's washroom. Likewise, while his symbols were a little more matronly for those of a woman's washroom, we would still actually recognize that same symbol today as indicating a woman's washroom. However, today in 2013, observations suggest that we today actually interpret those symbols with a clarity that was missing from 1967. A major daily in 1967 ran a story called Expo is having trouble with its sign language. <laughs> Noting that trouble soon arose over the washroom symbols, Expo officials kept encountering that worried woman who trotted nervously up to a restroom door, examined the pictograph with some puzzlement, reached for the handle, then retreated in blushing confusion as men appeared from inside. <laughs> These days, pictograms for washroom symbols are widely used in many nations and they themselves demonstrate near limitless variety. Uh, indeed, I'll note that this floor of the Princeton Club actually has symbols that would be recognizable as falling within the same genre. So that, ladies and gents, brings us to an inconvenient booth, wherein we find people mistaking symbol for both map and territory. The territory is the imperfect human in all its imperfect glory, while well, a map is the construction of expectations of gender performance, and the battleground is apparently that of transsexual people and access to public conveniences. Bizarre contortions of language, which is itself a symbol, are used to delegitimize trans identities, to imply or even state outright that trans people do not have a right to relief. <coughs> Indeed, even the notion of trans as people is sometimes contested because most people have great difficulty recognizing the humanity of another person if they cannot recognize that person's gender. Even in Canada, anti-relief rhetoric relies on claims of possible abuse of claimed gender identity as a legitimate reason to preemptively ban any individuals from such relief on the notion that someone, someday, somehow, might some how do something bad, and just in case, no one should be able to use the John or the Jane without some sort of non-specified yet highly intrusive verification that one's need to use the facilities is a legitimate need to use the legitimate facility. The rhetoric is often breathless and frequently frightening and is an overt attempt to evoke particular semantic reactions. If these postulations are to be believed, trans people themselves are part of some sort of vast bathroom conspiracy that is intended to unleash their terrible genius on those beholden to public conveniences. The territory of the imperfect human. We need to note that trans people have been around for some time. That exact time is indeterminate, as words such as transsexual and transgender are both, 20 cent, uh, both of 20th century vintage. Yet uh, ancient Pharaoh Hatshepsut, ruling nearly 35 centuries ago, had herself solely depicted as a male king, wearing the Pharaoh's headdress, the Pharaoh's kilt, and the Pharaoh's false beard without any female traits. Whether she intended to be understood as male or was using the symbols of male power to affirm her place in Egypt's hierarchy is unknown, as the names she used as king were formed with grammatically correct feminine participles, thus openly acknowledging her female status. 
As the example of Pharaoh Hatshepsut illustrates, labeling of a person as either male or female becomes problematic as we can create confusion if our labels create inadequate categories relative to the territory. Centuries later, we cannot know whether Hatshepsut's many monuments were destroyed or defaced by her successor for the erasure of her audacious kingship or if she were merely the target of political expediency of a subsequent ruler. However, if the former, then Hatshepsut stands as an excellent example of the absurdity of demanding such impossible conditions to preserve until this day such delusional formulas as standards of evaluation. <clears throat> the map of the expectations of gender performance. Kruszewski warned of the danger of mistaking symbols for things, symbols for reality. What are the words and symbols that I am concerned with being mistaken for reality? Male, female, and symbols for their respective public conveniences are the abstractions that I'm discussing today. These abstractions are often expressed through gender performance and expectations of gender performance. Codified expectations for gender performance are commonly found today in all sorts of places, including corporate dress requirements that may go beyond the basic safety requirements rationally required for the work at hand to be performed. These may include restrictions around types of clothing, hairstyles, personal ornamentation, <coughs> etc. There's also legal codes that may affirm gender performance, and those exist in many nations, may also include restrictions on a person's clothing, style, or type of clothing, other mutable matters, such as body, hair, and personal ornamentation. And these expectations may also be coded through religious or cultural norms that may coincide or conflict with legislative expectations from municipal, regional, or national authorities. It's important to keep in mind that historic and contemporary North America is not free of such expectations, that as early as the 1850s, a number of US municipalities started passing ordinances that would prevent uh, a man or a woman to be appearing in public in a dress not of his or her sex. And as recently as 2012, a research report recommended that a police officer needs to actually talk with a transgender woman before arresting her to verify that she is in fact actually breaking the law and not just assume that she is engaging in sex work merely because she's trans. Being mindful of Korsaevsky's admonition that whatever you say anything is, it is not, understanding the context of the whole word in its environment as used in debates regarding trans rights is important. Again, transsexual has been around since the beginning of the 20th century, and it typically refers to people who feel a strong desire to change their sexual morphology in order to live entirely as permanent full-time members of the gender other than the one that they were assigned at birth. Transgender is a more recently coined term, sometimes being used as an umbrella, inclusive of people undergoing medical transition, but also sometimes used to differentiate only those who identify with a gender other than the one that they were assigned at birth. Coinage of new terms attempts to more adequately describe claimed identities, such as, and notes that transgender draws attention to the impossibility of separate and homogenous identity categories, providing examples of the many ways in which identity is a bricolage of social distinctions, of gender, of sexuality, race, ethnicity, class, faith, and belief. Transitioning in a trans context may refer to medical or social transition or both. The experience of transitioning can be understood in terms of a movement from one gender position to another, from male to female, and vice versa. And some observations, descriptions, facts, and in inferences that arise are exemplified that in 2009, Canada saw the introduction of a federal bill to amend our Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code to include the terms gender identity and gender expression. Well, the next government in 2013 uh, saw an amendment to that bill be passed that would add only the phrase gender identity to those two acts. While well, Parliament 2013 has passed this amended bill, our Senate of 2013 has not yet completed the reading and committee process necessary for the bill to become enacted into statute. The text of both bills are brief. The more recent iteration more so due to the loss of the term gender expression and only the retention of the term gender identity. Nowhere in either bill does the notion of a public toilet arise. Yet, notwithstanding this lack, members of parliament have been willing to make assertions regarding the same. 
For example, Member of Parliament Dean Allison in 2012, um, in describing what he, what he was describing as a bathroom bill, um, noted that it would likely result in men who are in gender reassignment therapy having access to girls' bathrooms. In his lengthy speech, he continues stating that as the bill would also give special rights to those who simply consider themselves to be transgendered, the door would be open to sexual predators having a legal defense to charges of being caught in women's washrooms or locker rooms. And he concluded with, as sexual predators are statistically almost always men, imagine the trauma that a young girl would face going into a washroom or a change room at a public pool and finding a man there. It is unconscionable for any legislator, purposely or just neglectfully, to place her in such a compromising position. So putting aside for the moment assertions of trans status somehow overriding criminal law, Allison's statement is fascinating for its opening use of the alliterative bathroom bill that is then consistently dropped in favor of Canada's usual term to describe a public convenience, which is a washroom. Now his assertions, he is not alone in these assertions. Other federal MPs have said exactly the same thing. These handful of statements have followed exactly the same pattern. They start with an alliterative opener, followed by increasingly broad claims um, about the purported and deeply nefarious purpose of this bill. Given the context of Canadian distinctions between a washroom being a public toilet versus a bathroom being a toilet facility located in a private residence, uh, where might this penchant for bathroom in the phrase come from? If we look back, we can find that in 2009, an MP named Maurice Vellicott, Vellicott forwarded a letter to all of his parliamentary colleagues. This letter came from a lobby group, the Can Can Campaign Life Coalition. And in this letter, they say that in the US, uh, these gender identity bills have been dubbed bathroom bills for the reasons that we will explain. The reasons then enumerated culminate with a paragraph that states, this bathroom bill not only flies in the face of common sense, but is also potentially dangerous by creating the legitimized access that sexual predators often seek. Imagine a young girl, your daughter or granddaughter, goes into a washroom and finds a man there. How is the young girl to determine whether or not the man in the bathroom is a peeping Tom a rapist or a pedophile. It is unconscionable for any legislator to purposely place her in such a compromising position. Furthermore, if the young girl acts, reacts negatively to a man's pre presence and he turns out to be transsexual, she could potentially be charged with a hate crime. Here then appears to be the er moment, the birth of the confused application of an illiterate phrase to try to capture the hearts, minds, and bladders of Canadians. Subsequent to the circulation of this lobby group's letter, more nuanced challenges to the bills were to be found in arguments that the bill is unnecessary due to Canada's assertion of equality rights under our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, a part of Canada's constitution. The less nuanced challenges, however, continue to cover the same talking points enumerated in the lobby group's letter. Catchy illiterate phrasing, claims of special rights, claims of exemptions from existing criminal law, appeals to protect children. These talking points are all short on facts, but long on action. They're classic propaganda. A little would note that the facts, the data, the reasoning, all are forgotten, and only the impressions remain. And indeed, this is what the propagandist ultimately seeks, for the individual will never act on the basis of facts or engage in purely rational behavior. What makes him act is the emotional pressure, the vision of the future, the myth. At this time, the most recent iteration of the myth is the assertion that regardless of law, Canada has an immutable custom of never entering a washroom with a pictogram different than that of a person's gender identity. As anyone who has cared for children, has cared for elderly people, or disabled people, are only too aware this assertion too is clearly non-factual. This is yet another attempt to confuse symbols of humans with actual 
humans. Thank you.